Well, good evening, uh, at least this evening here. Uh, we are uh, here to talk about all electric homes, part of the uh, series with New Energy Colorado and uh, part of the 2020 uh, Metro Denver Green Homes virtual tour. So welcome, glad you could join us. And uh, uh, I am Peter Ewers and I've been uh, an architect for, uh, gosh, 30 something years now and had uh, my own firm, Ewers Architecture, for a little over 20 years. And uh, we're right here in Golden, Colorado. This is our office, so welcome, welcome to my office. And uh, uh, our focus has always been on sustainability. And uh, uh, just last year, we announced that everything we design from here on out is going to be uh, uh, focus on net zero energy and at very least all, all electric buildings. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, FYI, uh, as you're watching this, I'm gonna start off by talking about uh, why it's important to go all electric and, and some of the state of our current electric uh, systems in the United States and specifically here in Colorado. And then we're gonna talk about what we can do in existing homes for, uh, to, to make existing homes all electric or as, you, as you're remodeling your home. And then at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna talk more about new home construction. So I uh, wanted you to know that as you're, as you're watching. Uh, I think the, the information about existing homes is applicable to new homes as well. Uh, and then, uh, and then the information for the new homes really, uh, you, can't, you can do some things in new home construction that you can't do in existing. So uh, Ewers Architecture mission has always been uh, uh, creating beautiful architecture that respects our natural resources. And so that is uh, just a part of who we are. And uh, our design goals, as we're designing residences, because uh, we do both residential and commercial, but as we're designing residences specifically, uh, we want to make sure that the flow through the house uh, is very, uh, makes sense, is casual, and uh, is not awkward. Uh, the flow from inside to outside is very important. Get, you get people outside. The, the outdoor living spaces, especially here in Colorado, uh, can be just wonderful so much of the year. And then uh, third is beauty. We want to inject beauty into everything we do. And fourth, and definitely not least, is the uh, sustainability uh, aspect. So all four of those are equally important in our, in our minds, and, uh, and that sustainability has to be an integral part of, of everything that we do. So the truth is, this is a simple statement that uh, I believe to be, to be true, there's three parts. We have the knowledge and technology now to create high efficiency, high comfort, low energy consumption, all electric systems and buildings. That's the first part. I believe that to be true. The second part of this true statement is that we also have electricity providers creating electricity using renewable energy and minimizing our fossil fuels with a future of 100% renewable electricity flowing through our electric grid. And then the third part of this statement is, we must take advantage of our electric future and integrate all electric systems in our buildings now. So we are ready for our future. And so here's a little anecdote to explain that, that true statement. Uh, in 2003, December of 2003, I got uh, my first Toyota Prius. And it was a great vehicle, and it was brand new. The 2004 model uh, was groundbreaking in its fuel consumption. It was also groundbreaking in how it taught people uh, to drive. It had that real-time feedback that uh, showed you exactly how much, uh, uh, how much gasoline you were using per mile and uh, helped, helped us understand how we could drive to save, uh, to save fuel and, and drive up that fuel economy. It became kind of like a little video game right there in your car. How, how little gasoline can I use as I'm driving? Uh, they called that the Prius effect. It was actually named, it's a thing. We've taken that Prius effect into our buildings and have uh, dashboards in our buildings to show how much energy the, uh, the building is using. It was a great vehicle for the time, and it's still a good, good solid vehicle. But that's what we needed in 2004. We needed to drive down our fossil fuel uh, consumption. And that was, uh, that was important, and, uh, but now, now with the technology we have and with all electric 
uh, uh, technologies available, we now have things like the Tesla. And uh, so I traded in my, my Prius two years ago and got my uh, Model 3 Tesla in 2018, uh, almost two years ago to the day. Uh, an all-electric vehicle that is so much fun to drive and uh, again takes us to a new level that uh, we haven't been at before. And that new level now is that we have a vehicle that is even more fun to drive, accelerates. If you've been in an electric vehicle, you know how fast they accelerate and, and it kind of makes me laugh. It's a, a fun car to drive. Uh, but it also, it's all electric, so we're using zero gasoline and when I when I uh, uh, charge it here at my office with our solar panels, I'm literally driving on sunshine. And uh, the other thing is that uh, with, this, uh, with this all electric vehicle, now, uh, oh, I, we are getting 130 miles per gallon equivalent is the rating, the rating of the that I was getting with the Prius to now 130 miles per gallon equivalent. Uh, so we have upped the ante in terms of the amount of energy that we're using and it's all electric. And that is what we can also do with our buildings. And that's what I'm gonna uh, explain to you as we, as we move forward here. So let's look at the electricity trends uh, in our country. This is a chart of all of the energy used in the United States from 1950 to about 2017. And you can see that that curve goes up and up and up here. And this is 2004 uh, when, when the Toyota Prius came out. And uh, you can see it's trending downward now a little bit. And that's a, that's a good thing, right? So you can see here when we look at today, or in this case, the end of 2017. It's a couple of years old, but it it's, gets the point across. Our overall energy use is, is decreasing slightly. Also, the renewables, that's that green, that green on top, you can see that the renewables is, is slightly expanding, so they are increasing. You can also see that the carbon-based fuels uh, are trending downward uh, also, which is a good thing. So another chart to show, this is 2001 versus 2019. So 2001 on the left, that blue is uh, showing our overall, this is just electricity. The previous slide was all energy, so it included petroleum. This is only uh, electric use in the United States. Uh, so you can see from 2001 to 2019, trending down slightly, which is really no small feat when you think about it, because think of how much, uh, how many more buildings we have, how many more things are using electricity uh, over those two decades, right? So we've increased uh, what we're using electricity for, but at the same time, we've actually decreased the amount of electricity that we're using. So that's a good thing. Coal, this is probably the best part of this chart, Coal uh, has decreased about 50% in those two decades, and coal is, is uh, uh, more of a hazard for our, for our environment, so it's great to see that decreasing. Natural gas has increased, so that's, as coal goes down, natural gas has come up, but it hasn't, it hasn't come up as much as coal has dropped, so we're at least doing, uh, natural gas is kind of that stepping stone uh, for us as we transition to uh, all electric. Nuclear and hydro, those really haven't changed. We're not building any new nuclear plants. We're not building any new huge dam projects. Uh, that's dam without the N. Uh, huge dam projects. And then, but here's, here's what's exciting. We see wind showing up on this chart. That wind is not on the chart in 2001. We, we see it showing up now. And solar is actually uh, making enough, uh, enough electricity to show up on this chart showing all of the electric use uh, generation uh, in the United States. So that is really exciting and that is, that is why we need to uh, be really focusing on electricity. So uh, here's some uh, information also that came out uh, in, from Excel Energy. This was an article in the Denver Post uh, last year, uh, or actually two years ago, I guess. And what they did was Excel Energy put out this call for, uh, for proposals to build renewable energy, either wind or solar. And they would, they, these companies would provide that energy to Excel. And what happened was the 
electricity costs from wind and solar with, uh, with backup, with battery, uh, battery backup, uh, the store, battery storage, uh, those prices came in so low it astounded them. And that has continued over these last two years. Uh, wind and solar costs are dropping so greatly that they can build uh, wind and solar with, uh, with storage for less than they can even operate the existing coal burning power plants. So, and here's the thing. So this is straight off Excel Energy's website. They are, they are planning on being 80% renewable by the year 2030. 2030, that's, that's a decade, less than a decade away now. So within 10 years, 80% of the power flowing throughout Excel's territory, which is uh, most of Colorado, goes up into, uh, up into the Midwest, 80% of that power flowing through our power grid is going to be generated from renewable energy. And by 2050, they plan to be 100%. So how can we not? And oh, here's the thing is, it's levels they never imagined a decade ago. It is turning people's heads. Do you remember when LEDs came out? You know, what, 15 years ago maybe? LEDs were, were really you know, coming on the market and people were saying, wow, this is gonna be the future of, of light, of electric light. Uh, it's gonna replace fluorescence, it's gonna replace incandescence, and it, in, in two decades, it's gonna be, it's really gonna replace everything. And, it happened in just a few years. It happened so fast, it spun people's heads. Nobody predicted how fast LEDs were gonna take over the market, but they have. And that's what they're seeing with wind and solar. This is all happening so much faster. And I believe that the electric car market is gonna happen much faster than anyone's predicting as well. So, so if we're gonna have electricity flowing through our grid within the next 10 years that is nearly all from renewable energy, what can we do about it? What, can, what is it that we can do uh, in our own lives, in our own homes to prepare for that? What, what is it that we need to do? Well, like I said, we're gonna start talking about remodeling. What can we do with our existing homes that, uh, that can make a difference? And a couple of things that we can do is install high efficiency, all electric appliances and systems. And then uh, also we can increase insulation and tighten the exterior envelope. And those are things that we can do as we're remodeling, as we're doing things, as you're replacing an appliance in your home. Then for new construction, we can now, now today we can do this. You can insist that your new building is all electric and is net zero energy. We have absolutely the capable of, capability of doing that and it need not cost a lot more money. So we're gonna go into more depth. I'm gonna start with the remodeling and we're gonna talk about some remodeling ideas. Uh, so we'll start with uh, high efficiency, uh, all electric appliances and systems, okay? As you're working through, as you're remodeling your home, look at installing high efficiency uh, all electric appliances and systems like your building heat. So uh, this, this uh, furnace here, this is what we affectionately call scorched air. Uh, it's a uh, forced air furnace or a scorched air furnace. I uh, have a lot of these in, in basements around Colorado. And uh, so this is using natural gas typically to create a flame that the air is flowing across, okay? Well, we can replace that with something that looks like this. And this is a, uh, it's an air source heat pump system. So it has this unit on the outside, looks kind of like an air conditioner, right? But it creates both heating and cooling, and it is a one-to-one -one replacement for your furnace. So I'm not saying go out and throw away your furnace if you just replaced it last year, or five years ago even. But when your furnace is done, when it's ready to be replaced, replace it with an all electric central unit that uses, uh, it is mini split technology. So mini split technology, we usually think of as looking like this. That's, uh, that's what mini splits first came out like. Maybe you've seen it in a hotel room you've been in, or maybe, you, maybe you've uh, seen it in, in someone else's home or your own home. But they don't need to look like that anymore. Now they can look like this. 
This is a little cassette that we use. We install it above the ceiling and it, with a little simple duct work, uh, it's really nice to have uh, one of these on, on each floor of a home so that you have a thermostat for each floor and uh, two or three of those can run off of one exterior unit. So that's another, another option. Uh, another option is a ceiling cassette where it looks kind of like a bathroom fan, but it's hooked to that outside unit. So all of those, all four of these, these are all ways that you can create heating and cooling in your home based on this exterior unit. So, uh, but if you've already got the ductwork and you've already got your, your furnace that looks like that old one on the right, then you can you can one to one replace that with with that new central unit. So, mini split technology is here. It's doing great. Uh, there is no reason not to uh, not to use that in our homes. Another area where we use a lot of natural gas is water heating. And so this is an old old water heater. Uh, if you look closely at this photo, you can see it's, the lines are already cut. Uh, we're moving that out so that we can move in an all electric water heater. Now these water heaters, uh, it's, a, it's again the mini split type technology, air source heat pump. Uh, it takes, takes the heat out of the air and, and turns that heat using, using uh, uh, the air source heat pump technology to create the hot water for your home. So it does make the space that it's in cold. There are some systems out there, in fact we just installed one in our office here last year, where uh, they're ductible. So you have, you can duct in the air, uh, the, the warm air that you need. You can duct it from somewhere, say from behind the refrigerator where you don't want that hot air, right? Uh, and you can duct the, the cold air that's being created. You can duct that to say the crawl space or someplace uh, that you don't want it. You could even duct it to use, get some free cooling during the summer and then have a, a damper to direct it to someplace else during the winter when you don't want to be dumping cold air into your living room. So air source heat pumps, currently Excel Energy is giving a $400 rebate to install an, an air source heat pump in your home. So uh, ours was $1,300 last year minus the $400 rebate, $900 for a new uh, very high efficiency water heater. I should take this opportunity to explain these, these mini, uh, the mini split technology, the air source heat pump technology are typically 300% and more efficient. So they have uh, what's called the coefficient of performance, the COP is, is typically around 3.3, 3.4 depending upon the system. And so that means that for every one unit of electricity that you put into the air source heat pump technology, you're getting three 3.4 uh, units of, in this case, hot water, uh, or in the furnace, you're getting 3.4 3 units of hot air or cooled air uh, out of that. So uh, rather than, yes, we have electric water heaters. We've had electric water heaters for years. We've never put one in one of our projects because we, we always use natural gas because natural gas was so much more efficient. Those old electric water heaters are 100% efficient. For every unit of electricity you put in, you get one unit of hot water out. These, with the, with the air source heat pump technology, you put in one, one unit of electricity and you get three units or more of hot water out. So that is why this is so exciting to have this kind of technology available to us now that wasn't available just a few years ago. So when we can use all electric systems that have that kind of that kind of efficiency, now we've really made some leaps and bounds and we've, and we've got to get this technology into our homes. I, I know hearing something that is 300% uh, efficient is, might be a little hard to believe, but it's true. And, and this technology has been around uh, in, in Europe and in, uh, in the uh, uh, Far East for uh, quite a number of years and is making more, uh, more gains now in the United States. And, and it really has become much more efficient. We've fine-tuned the technology now. And uh, if, if you don't believe it, Google it. Uh, check out the coefficient of performance of a heat pump water heater uh, or mini split. And uh, also, uh, it's a little unbelievable how it feels when I'm driving my Tesla. And when I get into that and, and I take off and to know that I, uh, the 130 miles per hour or 130 miles per gallon equivalent, 
uh, is, is pretty unbelievable that it is true. And that technology, all these technologies that we're talking about today, are, are now tried and true. They're proven technologies. They're, not, they're no longer way out there. So check it out. And uh, uh, everything I'm saying has been uh, absolute fact. So another place that we typically use uh, uh, natural gas in a lot of our homes is cooking. And a lot of people love the gas cooktop. Uh, this is actually my, my uh, uh, cooktop in my home. I love natural gas, but we have now have a great replacement, a great all-electric replacement for natural gas. We don't have to have those old uh, electric cooktops that uh, take forever to heat up and then, and then stay hot for forever and you've got to move the pan off. This is a, an induction cooktop and uh, using magnets and maybe a little bit of uh, mumbo jumbo, but they're, they're really amazing. They, they are instant on, instant off. Uh, you set the temperature and immediately it's at that temperature and uh, they are still a little bit on the pricey side, but I think as they gain more and more traction, those are gonna drop in price and become more and more used. In fact, a couple of places I've stayed recently have had those, so I've had the opportunity to cook on them, and they really are, are quite wonderful. Uh, the only downside I think I've heard on those is you can't flambe, because you can't, you can't tilt the pan. If you tilt the pan, if you break that, uh, break the, uh, uh, the seal between the, the, the bottom of the pan and the cooktop, you won't be getting any heat, but so. Uh, and then lastly, our clothes dryer. And a gas clothes dryer for years has been the most efficient, well, second to maybe going outside and hanging your clothes out to, to dry outside. But, but the, uh, the gas dryer has uh, always been kind of the, the more, more efficient option. Uh, but now we have that same heat, heat pump technology in, gas, in dryers. So you can get a heat pump dryer. These are, I would say, still on the, uh, the upswing. They're still learning about them. They're still on the expensive side. So. Uh, if you're, but if you are replacing your, your dryer and you've got, uh, well, an electric or gas dryer, uh, look at the, the heat pump dryer. They're definitely worth a look, and I think in coming years they will be more and more the norm rather than the exception. So some more remodeling ideas, uh, increasing insulation, tightening the exterior envelope. So again, as you're remodeling, as you're considering doing work on your home, look at uh, window replacement. So we have super efficient windows that are available now. Alpen is a company right here in Colorado, makes a fantastic, uh, fantastic window that is actually, you can get them all the way up to R11. So that's a U value of 0.09. Uh, and uh, so the U value is the inverse of the R value. So a 0.09 U value would be about an R11 uh, or greater and those are the, their top line windows. They also have, they have uh, other, other lines that are, uh, I think they start at about an, an R, R5 or a U value of 0.2. And those are maybe a little bit more affordable. But if you're replacing your windows, think about those. Or there are a lot of what's becoming very popular these days are European windows. Uh, and they are a little bit on the, on the pricey side typically more expensive than the Alpen, but beautiful windows from, from Europe that also have those very, very high, uh, uh, high R values, low U values. If you are thinking about replacing your windows, think about that. How, how do those R values compare to a standard wall? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, so if you think about uh, the window, and the window has typically been the weak link in our walls. So if we're, if we're building a, uh, a standard wall to code is going to be about an R20. So, and, and right now, code for a window is uh, a U value of 0.31, so about an R value of 3. So you've got this R3 window with an R20 wall, and so that window is going to feel cold, and you're going to get drafts from that window. But if you can get that window up to an R5 or R10, now that window no longer feels cold, that you can put your hand on the glass of this window right here, even when it's zero degrees outside, and it will not feel cold. So it's a comfort issue as well as a, an energy saving issue. You're, you will be more comfortable in a home with super insulated windows, super efficient windows. Exterior siding replacement, right? That's a normal thing people do. What can we do when we're doing that? Well, 
that's a great opportunity to install exterior rigid insulation around your entire home. If you are considering a, a siding replacement, take and, and uh, put exterior rigid insulation. It will be a continuous insulation, which is so much better than just the insulation between the studs, right? That's what we typically have. We have an R6 or, or a, a, a two by six wall with R19 insulation between the studs and then our exterior sheathing. Well, it, the studs are actually a thermal break. So you don't really have an R19 wall you've got to take every, every 16 inches, you've got to take that inch and a half stud out of there. So that R19 wall might really only be like an R15, R16 wall. When we get this exterior rigid insulation, say you do two inches of, of uh, insulation that might be an R10, now that is a real R10 wall. Uh, or R10 is, is continuous, so you add that to, say, your R15 that you already have, now you've got an R25 wall. That would be quite an improvement in the comfort and the energy use of your home. Also, uh, another way to do that is to use, we use a lot of these zip uh, sheathing. So this is uh, a polyiso insulation with uh, exterior uh, with the sheathing bonded to it and then the house wrap bonded to that. So it all, comes all in one package, you put that up and then you're ready to put your siding right over that. Another way to do good exterior continuous insulation. And by the way, these things I'm talking about as remodels, of course, can be used in new construction. So. And something else we do regularly, we re-roof, right? Roofing typically is going to last you know, 20, 25 years, something like that, and then you're gonna need to re-roof if you've got a typical asphalt shingle roof. Uh, we tend to try not to use asphalt shingle roofs. We use things like uh, in, in our office, this is what our office looked like before we re-shingled uh, last year, and this is what it looks like now. These are uh, actually a polyurethane shingle sculpted to look like a, uh, a, a shake shingle because on this historic structure, that's what would have been there originally. Uh, we really try to stay away from asphalt shingles. They're a petroleum product. Uh, but when, we were re when you are re-roofing, you uh, can consider putting on uh, solar uh, panels on your roof. If you've got a 20-year-old roof, do not run out and put photovoltaic panels on it because then in five years when you have to re-roof, you have to take those solar panels off. But when you're re-roofing, consider photovoltaics and plan for it. Uh, another good option on roofs that we, we use a lot on our project are uh, standing seam metal roofs. The standing seam metal is a, a great, great product. Uh, it's more hail resistant, especially than asphalt shingle. Uh, but the standing seam, we can clip uh, clip the, the uh, uh, supports for the photovolta photovoltaic panels to the standing seam metal and not have to penetrate, not have to put in these, uh, these penetrations through your brand new roof. So uh, standing seam metal is a, definitely a preferred option. And I would say that another plug for not putting in asphalt shingles is asphalt shingles are gonna be the most susceptible to hail, which here in Colorado is a big problem. So may not be in your environment, but in Colorado, hail is the, uh, the Colorado gemstone, they call it. So, so more remodeling ideas. Uh, replacing lights with LED, that's a no-brainer. Replacing plumbing fixtures with low-flow fixtures. Looking for Energy Star appliances, that's a real thing. When you go to buy a toaster or a TV or a computer, look for that Energy Star label. That means it's going to use less electricity than, than its counterparts. Uh, than, than the competitors. Low VOC finishes, that's volatile organic compounds, so you create a healthier indoors. You're not, uh, you're not breathing those organic compounds. Recycled materials, materials that can be recycled at the end of our lives, all things, all things to, uh, to consider. Carbon sequestering materials, that's woods. As, wood, as trees grow, right, they absorb, they absorb carbon, and then if we can use that wood and the things that were, uh, are going to be around for a long time, we've sequestered that carbon. Uh, locally made products is important, so you have less shipping. Long lasting materials and products, not buying the cheap stuff that, uh, that you're gonna have to replace in five years, but investing in something better that lasts longer. Uh, low embodied energy is another thing you can look for. And this is not running off the bottom of the screen on purpose, avoiding red list materials, chemicals. It's, this list goes on and on. Sustainability is a part of everything we do. Every decision we make, uh, or so many decisions we make every day, uh, there are sustainable alternatives 
that, that uh, are, are better. And so as we remodel, as we do go through our lives, think about those choices. It can be as simple as, am I going to ride my bike two miles down the road, or am I going to get in my car and drive it? So then let's talk a little bit about new construction ideas. So I would say everything we've talked about to this point can be remodeling ideas or new construction. But when we think about new construction, we have some more options than we have just in, in remodeling. So first, passive solar and sustainable design techniques. Uh, let's talk about that just a little bit. What can we do as we're starting to think about building a new home? What are the, what are the things we want to think about? Well, here's one. We want to string it out long in the east-west orientation. So this was a, a fun project we did a few years ago where the client came to us with this sort of uh, this sort of uh, plan uh, they had already sketched up. It was a really kind of clunky, very squarish plan, but they had this great site with south facing uh, a south facing view, and uh, we can take advantage of that by stringing out long in that east west direction and having, having that sun filter more into the house. And then put the things on the back of the house on the north side that don't need that sun. They're not places that you are all day long. They're, uh, and we can use that sun both for daylight and for building heat then. So this is what that house looked like. Fortunately, they, they liked the, uh, the scheme where we strung it out long in the east-west direction. It was actually off-grid, and it was a real benefit to, to have that east-west orientation. So if you're looking for a site to build a new home, try to get one that has good south, uh, south orientation where you, can, where you can string out long in that east-west direction. And here's the, here's the reason we do that, because the south sun is so easy to control. It's just the way, uh, the way nature is that our summer sun here in Colorado reaches its peak at about 74 degrees. And so with not too big of an overhang, uh, we can cut out that summer sun. So in, in, inside the house uh, during the summer when you don't want that sun beating into your house, it's not. You're cutting it out with a simple overhang. And then in the winter when, when it's uh, cool out and you want that sun to come in, it's, that sun is down at a 26 degree angle off the horizon. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the highest it gets. Uh, during the during the in the winter solstice here in Colorado, uh, that that sun is penetrating into your house and heating uh, heating your home uh, with uh, passive solar. So that is why that east west orientation is important. The the east sun uh, is is hard to control. The west sun is really uh, is a terrible uh, problem for overheating homes. And uh, here in Colorado, if you're out on the plains and you got that beautiful view to the west of the mountains, it's really it, it is very it is problematic. So getting that uh, getting that south sun, that south orientation, strung out along the east-west direction, and uh, and the proper shading. And uh, when you do have a tall glass wall like that, that was a two-story glass wall, we inject a uh, solar shade in the middle of it so that we cut out uh, cut out that sun uh, coming into the lower windows because. It's hard if you've got a really tall glass wall. It's hard to get out far enough to shade that whole wall in the summer. That's a very typical detail for us on many of our homes. So thermal mass would be the next step. Uh, hard to add thermal mass when you're remodeling, but if you uh, you're building a new home, you can think about using materials that uh, that will absorb that sun. Because here's what happens: is the the sun beats in. And even during the winter, that sun comes in, and if you don't have anywhere for that sun to go, if it's just warming up the air and, and the, the materials aren't, aren't a solid like stone or concrete material that that sun can soak into, it's gonna immediately overheat the, ho the home. And then when that sun goes away, it's immediately gonna get cold. So what we wanna do is we wanna store that, store that solar energy and we do that with thermal mass. So this home had a concrete floor, it's got a stone fireplace, this stone wall uh, at the back of the living room, all places where when that sun beats in, it's not gonna immediately overheat the home, it's gonna, it's gonna warm up those really solid, thick materials, and then, uh, and then as, this, as the sun goes away, then that, uh, those thick materials will give that heat back to the home uh, throughout the evening. And, so thermal mass is very important in a passive solar design. Another idea for new construction is insulation, well beyond code requirements. Uh, code is 
is the minimum. You have to do code, right? But we, uh, here are our rules of thumb that we use. This is our goal on, on each home that we're designing. R5 or better for the windows, so that's a U value of 0.2. Uh, R10 below the slab, so it's just the, the numbers double as you go up, 5, 10, 20, 40, 80. Uh, but they're good, good rules of thumb. The R10 is below the slab, uh, in the, whether you're in the basement or whether it's a slab on grade at, uh, for your first floor. R10 below the slab is a good minimum. R20 walls below grade, so in the basement where the, the, the walls are already buffered by, uh, by the soil, right? The soil's not gonna get, here in Colorado, it's not gonna get below about 45 degrees. So an R20 wall is okay down at that level. Once you get to walls above grade, where it could be zero degrees or colder outside, we'd like to have R40 as our goal. We will not do anything less than R30, and R40 is our goal. And then for the roof, uh, R80 is our goal. Again, we won't do less than R60, but R80 is, R80 is better. We feel like, especially the R40 walls and the R80 roof, going above that, you probably have a little bit of diminishing returns. You can, you can do an R100 roof. It's not, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Uh, incidentally, uh, code is R3 for windows. Below slab, not really required except for the edges. I can't tell you how many times we get the contractor calling and saying, yeah, we don't want to do that under slab insulation. It's not required by code. It's like, no, you need to do it. R20 uh, walls below grade. Um, i trying to think what code actually is for that. I'm not sure. <laughs> R40 walls above grade. Code is R20 in our environment, and the roof is R49 required. So go well above uh, whatever environment you're in. I'd encourage you to go well above the, uh, the code requirements. So and code is getting better and better, but the, the still not good is, enough. The roof is typically not insulated. It's, are you talking about the attic? in most cases? Yeah, yeah, the attic or depending upon... Yeah, I, and okay. yeah can yeah. you make sure. a distinction attic yeah. roof? Yeah, okay. And that R80 for the roof, uh, we're talking about whether if you have an attic space, that insulation might be right at the bottom of the attic, but if you have a vaulted ceiling, uh, then that, that insulation is going to be a part, of, uh, a part of your roof structure. So in whatever way, that R80 is somewhere between your upper ceiling and the, and the roof. So that's, uh, that's what we're calling roof insulation. And uh, to get those levels of insulation, there are a lot of different ways that you can go, a lot of different products. Uh, you, don't, you can use fairly standard construction, but you can also consider structural insulated panels, known as SIPs. Uh, ICFs are insulated concrete forms. Uh, there are a couple of different, uh, or there are several different types of in ICFs out there. Most of them are a polystyrene. There are also products out there that don't use any polystyrene, which is nice. Uh, this, this home here, actually, uh, we used ICFs in that home as well as straw bale. Uh, but they, it was a fast wall or Durasol are two products that are, uh, they, they do not have any polystyrene in them. You can check those out. Uh, double stud wall construction, we use a lot on a lot of our homes. Continuous exterior rigid insulation, it's going to be one or the other, sometimes both. If we're doing kind of a standard construction, it's either double stud walls or continuous ex exterior uh, insulation. Uh, the zip sheathing is one form of that continuous exterior. And straw bale, straw bale is uh, fun. It's another way to sequester carbon. Uh, straw is a, 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 a waste material that is, once it, once it, it degrades or is burned, is gonna release the carbon back into the atmosphere by, by sequestering it into a wall like this. That's the back wall of that house. Uh, we, are, we are sequestering that carbon, plus we're creating a nice, uh, well-insulated wall. And uh, so building it tight. Uh, is, is, we believe, the right way to, to build. And there are a lot of, lot of ways to do that, uh, making sure every little crack gets sealed up around the exterior. Uh, one, way, uh, one way to do that is uh, Aero Barrier. We've used this on a couple of homes now, and it's a great, great product. Uh, if you think of duct sealing, when uh, there's, for a long time, we've had this uh, ability to spray into duct work and it will go and, and fill all the cracks in the ducts. Well, this uh, product, actually they spray it throughout the entire home. You can't do it as a remodel. Again, it's gotta be done when you're building the home uh, and, and it's typically done at the end of 
uh, the end of uh, gypboard, when, when once you have the entire home uh, complete inside, and they set up these spray nozzles and uh, spray throughout the home. So we recently completed a home where we got the air changes down to under 0.5 air changes per hour at 50 Pascal uh, using, using this. So uh, it's a great, uh, great option for new construction. It's surprisingly not that expensive and to, to uh, really tighten up your home uh, can be a, a kind of a fun, fun way to do that, an easy, easy way to do that. So. And uh, energy recovery ventilators or our conditioning ERVs uh, are, are a, a part of every project that we do. So as we build tighter and tighter, uh, what we're actually doing is you're sealing up that home and who wants to live in a, uh, a sealed environment, right? We need fresh air. Uh, as, as we breathe, we're, we're using up that fresh air. Uh, and so we need to, uh, we need to bring in fresh air, but if it's zero degrees outside, going and opening up a window is not what we want to do, right? So we want to continually have fresh air entering the home, and that's where the ERVs come in. So energy recovery ventilators, also HRVs is another term, heat recovery ventilator. Uh, the ERV does both heating, cooling, and it does uh, uh, the moisture, the, the humidity in the air, it recaptures that. So uh, ERVs work by uh, taking, the, it exhausts the air from inside the home and brings in the outside air. Uh, and at that same time, it transfers the heating or cooling that you're exhausting and puts that into the air coming in. So say it's zero degrees outside, it's 70 degrees inside, you're exhausting your 70 degree air and bringing in zero degree air, but you transfer uh, that heating the, the heat that is in that exhaust air, you transfer it to the incoming air, and that's what the, that's what the ERV does. It recovers that ventilation that you've already paid to, uh, to, to heat up and uh, captures that again. So it creates a very comfortable home. Uh, look, if it's nice out and you want to open up your windows, great. But who wants to open up the windows when it's 100 degrees and humid outside or it's zero degrees and freezing outside? Uh, and this will, this will uh, allow your home to be comfortable 365 days a year. So a little hard, again, to integrate this into a remodel, but in new construction, absolutely something that we put in every home. Uh, the CERV, by, by the way, is, uh, adds, it's an ERV with a conditioning element. So it basically uses, uh, it uses like a little mini split technology to heat and cool the air to, uh, because if you, if you do have zero degree coming in and you're exhausting 70 degree air, you can't bring that zero degree air all the way up to 70, but bring it close, but then the, the conditioning uh, part, uh, a CERV, will raise that, raise that air uh, to the, the level that you want to actually bring into the home. But there are a lot of ways to deal with this uh, and a lot of good people out there that can help you with that. And uh, so the all electric and efficient systems, this is just a, re, uh, a replay of what we already saw when we're talking about remodels, same thing. So this is, the, this is that, uh, that unit that sits up above the ceiling and you have a little ductwork running around. Uh, that's the mini split technology, the, the air source heat pump, uh, the heat pump water heaters, uh, the, the uh, dryers, the heat pump dryers, and of course our, our uh, induction cook cooktops those things that we already talked about, that's gonna, that's gonna help you create your all electric home, which is so important to, uh, to getting to net zero energy. So, and then you plan for photovoltaics. This is, uh, this is that house uh, that I showed with the straw bale. It doesn't happen by accident. You gotta plan it. You've gotta plan where are the photovoltaics gonna be. They don't have to be on the roof. They can be ground mounted. In fact, here in Colorado, when we're building up in the mountains, we prefer ground mounting because uh, when the snow when the snow lands on that roof and if it stays on there for a week, you're not generating any electricity with those PV panels. Where if it's ground mounted, you can go grab your broom and brush them off, and and uh, and you're creating electricity again. So uh, there are all different ways to do it, but it needs to be thought about and planned uh, during the design phase. So finally, I just want to touch on uh, this is this is everything I've talked about today is available now, and it is. 
uh, with those technologies, we can create all electric net zero energy homes. But there's even stuff coming in the future that's going to uh, help us, like uh, photovoltaics that are built into other materials, and they don't just have to look like a PV panel, or improved battery technology. Uh, that's getting better and better and going to make our houses more efficient. Improved mini-split technology. Uh, the magic box is, is what I'm waiting for. That's a, like a CERV, but it takes care of the entire home. You don't need anything else, just this one system that's your ERV and all of your, your uh, building heating and cooling. Phase change materials, uh, there's another, uh, an, another uh, session that you can watch that's a part of this where uh, they used phase change mater materials in a home. It's, they're actually available now, but getting better and better. Uh, vacuum sealed panels, uh, that's mostly a roof, roof insulation, but they get to nearly R30 per inch. Yeah, you heard me right, R30 per inch. So a two inch vacuum sealed panel, you got your R60 roof already there. Uh, improved automation technologies. We have good automation. It still can be a little frustrating to use and you kind of feel like you're uh, a geek uh, uh, trying, to, trying to figure it all out. So uh, looking forward to seeing automation technologies improve. Solar gardens, uh, we've got some here in Colorado. So if you can't get photovoltaics on your roof, like my house, which has too big a, too big a trees around, invest in a solar garden as they become available. The DC power grid, that might be the one that's reaching the most. Some people are talking about building a DC power grid throughout our, our entire country. But across the country, we definitely need to have that electric car supercharger uh, network. Uh, Tesla has done a great job with theirs, but it doesn't work for other automobiles. So uh, looking forward to seeing more and more of that. So, so with all of that, I would conclude with saying that in 2004, we saw the advent of the Prius effect. And we were able to figure out how to save energy and use as little as possible. And we kind of were hoping that, that was enough, right? And now in 2020, we have the Tesla effect. We can use all electric and efficient systems. We can gener generate our own electricity. And we can have fun doing it. So let's do that together. Thank you.